So when the Buddha um, started his teachings, and he was convinced by Brahma, as the story goes, to um, not give up on humanity, which he initially wanted to do when um, he had his enlightenment, he looked around and, according to legend, he said to himself, um, no one's going to understand this. So he just thought he would go on permanent retreat. And Brahma came out from wherever Brahma is, you know, and uh, begged him to teach for the sake of all beings. And he, um, you know, acceded to that request. Um, it took two weeks of convincing. <laughs> That's not a good sign. <laughs> um, but what the Buddha was agreeing to was trying to um, help all, all humanity, well, all the world, in essence, all sentient beings, not to create a religion, not to create a sort of a school, um, an ism. So uh, the Buddha is one who is awake. You know, in some Buddhist countries, they don't have a name for it as a, like their religion. It's just the way. It's just what they, what they do. You know, it's their moral code. It's how to live, basically how to live well. <clears throat> um, so when the Buddha was teaching and throughout the 45 years of teaching, the teachings were given to different groups at different times. The majority, of course, um, the majority was given to the Sangha, the you know, group of ordained monks and nuns um, who lived and practiced with the Buddha or in different monasteries where he would travel to. But throughout his career, his teaching career, he um, taught to villagers, taught to lay people, <clears throat> taught even to different religions, and taught to rulers as well. Um, he advised kings how to rule. And this is was created in a, there's this very special sutta and collection of teachings which are not um, quoted very much called the Dasavida um, Raja Dhamma, which is the 10 virtues of a ruler. Raja is a king, the virtues of a king. Basically, it's 10 qualities a king or a ruler should have, according to the Buddha's teaching, according to what the Buddha taught. And it's kind of, I guess it shouldn't be surprising that it's a, not a well-known uh, sutra. <laughs> you know, it's kind of skipped over. <laughs> Everybody reads about, you know, the Anapanasati and Satipatthana sutras about teaching techniques of mindfulness and, you know, those are things we can do. Um, and the Parinibbana when the Buddha died. Right, and the training of the world sutra where he gave his first, you know, main teachings where we get all the, you know, main dharma of the Four Noble Truths and such. Um, but the real nuts and bolts for a ruler, and it wasn't specifically just for a ruler, the person at the top of the pyramid, <clears throat> is talking about how to live in a way that when you are with others, and at any time, at some point, you're going to be in a position of authority. Everybody, at some point, is going to be, is going to have some authority over someone else. Um, even if it's just someone who's a colleague of yours, who's new to the job, and you have to show them the ropes. You have to kind of show them what to do, Right. Or it's somebody who is a fellow student and they need your help. Whatever it is, you're an authority at that time. As a parent, you know, one of the um, 
things that I've contemplated often by being a parent is the fact that I have, at least in the younger years, absolute authority over these people. Absolute. It's kingship. It really is. <laughs> you know, the subjects are unruly. They don't always, you know, obey. <laughs> and they don't, you know, pledge allegiance or give any honor. But um, but you're the you're the final authority. It doesn't last. But at some point, you know, there's that if your parents are an authority, even when you're not um, with them. So you're going to have this role. You may have it already, whether it's in an organization, okay, whether it's in a family, whether it's with others, whether it's with friends, whether it's as a teacher, you know, at some point at work, at home, in society, um, you're going to rule. You know, however that will be. As a teacher, I mean, it's, it's nice, it's kind of gentle, it's, it's pleasant, it's not absolute, it's not um, arbitrary, that's what I'm trying to say. It's qualified, and it's defined. You know? But it's still, I feel that the Buddha was teaching how to use authority in a way that is still expressing the Dharma. It then becomes an aspect of the Dharma. So whatever you're teaching and whatever your authority is in, ultimately, it's the authority of the Dharma. Okay, it's expressing the teachings of an enlightened life. And I think that's what he's trying to bring into it. In the same way, the Eightfold Path was about how we live moment by moment in every activity, whether it's work, play, home, you know, formal meditation, or just speaking, all these things are expressions of the Dharma, if we choose to see our way, you know, as the way. And so too, whenever you are um, exerting some authority, uh, it can be the expression of the Dharma. And I feel that's what the, um, the Raja um, Dhamma, the Raja Dhamma, the King's Dharma. Okay, Raja is King. And so the King's Dharma, right? What is the Dharma of a um, someone who has some authority, even for one moment? <clears throat> so these qualities, I want to go over the ten with you, just because it's so refreshing. It's so refreshing to be to think of authority in this way. The first, um, the first quality is what the first quality on the, on the Buddha's list of um, Raja Dhamma. Okay, of the king's dharma is dana, generosity. That was the first on the list, is being generous. You know, that all your possessions, whatever you own, is for the sake of others. You may have a castle, but it's theirs actually. And you should never forget that what you own is theirs. Right? And that, that's a wonderful thing. It doesn't say that you should be poor because that may reduce your authority then. Right? But you should always remember that whatever you own is for the sake of your subject. Yeah. That, that's an amazing thing to keep in mind. That taxpayers' money is theirs. <laughs> and you're borrowing it to help them out. <laughs> that's um, important to remember and easy to forget. And I think he put it at the top of the list because he knows what happens when you give people money that they're not accountable for. You know, they start to use it for themselves. You know? <clears throat> That's just, it's, I mean, 2,500 years ago, it's the same story. No, we're no different, really. I mean, the, the beauty of the Dharma is that it's expressing people today and throughout history. It's expressing human nature. You know? Um, the other number two on the list you can already predict it it's sila it's morality having a moral life you know? so the quality of a ruler number two is that you're able to keep the precepts you know that you have uh, 
you're upholding a moral life. You are an example, a moral example. Right? Your subjects don't need to excuse your behavior. You know, and say, oh, well, that's what everyone does. No. You are something that they can look up to, right, as a moral example. You know, the five precepts are not killing, not stealing, okay, not abusing relationships, <clears throat> not speaking falsely, not using intoxicants, okay? So, keeping those precepts, you know, it's just basic. Being a ruler, I mean, you've got to be an example. Being an authority, you've got to be an example. That's sila. Um, the next one, uh, number three, is called altruism. Altruism, also a kind of archaic word, right? It just means being unselfish, being really unselfish. That your motivation for ruling, your motivation for telling someone what to do, your motivation for being an authority or being a teacher is for others, right? Not for one's own glory. That's altruism. <clears throat> Number uh, four on the list is Ajivya. In um, Pali, it's called honesty. Honesty. You know, that's right speech. Um, but also, it's right intention. You're doing it for the right reason. Number five on the list of the Buddha's qualities of the Rajadhamma is called gentleness. Gentleness. Okay, he uh, explains it further, saying it's being kind, being kind and gentle as you exert authority. That, that's actually a really um, rare and gentle, um, rare and gentle. And he explains it further by saying that gentleness, which is interesting, this is the gentleness avoids all arrogance, okay, and it never defames others. That's an interesting thing for gentleness. The gentleness, the kindness. You know? So if you're real gentle, you're not standing above. <clears throat> gentle and kind. So let's just review. We're now in the middle of the list. There's Dana. Right? Being real generous. Understanding that what you own is really owned by all. Sila. You know, the basic, um, basic way to live by causing non-harm. That's sila. Altruism, you know, you understand the intentions. The intentions are for others, not for oneself. <clears throat> Honesty. Okay. Gentleness, gentle kindness. Wow, those are pretty good qualities. Now, we're only halfway through the list, but I want to express that the deepest um, authority that one has and um, the most important ruler you have to be is of yourself. So though he's the Raja Dharma is describing outwardly how people in positions of authority, what qualities they need to cultivate. We always are in a position of authority. It's the authority of you with yourself. You are ultimately responsible for your own mind. Whatever situation you're in, even if you're in prison, you are your own king or queen. And that ultimate authority we have to take, you know, as a basic truth. No, nobody can control your mind. You can. And these are the qualities with which you can do it. So when we see this list and we say, yeah, I mean, okay, ruler, fine. Yes, you are a ruler. You have to understand that you are a ruler, right? You are. You're ruling yourself. Nobody else. Mm -hmm. And that's why this list is pretty important. Okay, uh, six is called self control. <laughs> self control, right? Seven 
is non-anger. That being free from hatred and remaining remaining calm in the midst of confusion. That's great. Non-anger. Now, last week, um, at the college I teach at downtown, there they had a panel of uh, Knesset members to have a discussion, a debate. I wasn't able to go, but I asked one of my students who attended. I said, "So how was it?" He said to me. It was chaos. <laughs> there were seven people, one from each of different party, and a full audience in an auditorium. And she said, everyone started shouting. I'm like, what do you mean I started shouting? Like, who started shouting? Who was shouting? Who, like, audience members? The, the Knesset members? Said, yeah, they started shouting at each other, and then the audience started shouting at them. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody could hear anything that they said. <laughs> Right? And that was like the end of it. That was the end of the discussion. <laughs> uh, I guess they didn't read this list. <laughs> Non-anger is, as the Buddha wrote, being free from hatred and remaining calm in the midst of confusion. There's a lot of confusion. Okay, a lot of confusion. Right. And remaining calm in the midst of confusion is a, the quality of a ruler, the person who rules herself. Right. Somebody can, I mean, it's funny how that old saying, did you have a saying like this about sticks and stones? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You know that one? Mm-hmm. As a child, no, you didn't have that rhyme. I thought maybe there'd be a Hebrew equivalent. But yeah, what you know, what you say and what someone else says, it may come from a place of anger and you have to recognize that. You have to recognize their pain, but their pain is not your pain. You have to rule yourself. And that's the self-control and self-control which then can hold back that anger, which can maintain some clarity in the midst of confusion. Other people's confusion does not have to be your confusion. You can remain clear in the midst of confusion, which just may be the clarity enough to say, this is really confused, Mm -hmm. right? The clarity may just be that I am confused, but that clarity will allow you not to react with anger. Take refuge in your own confusion. A ruler is not afraid of his or her own confusion. <clears throat> of course, after the non-anger, you see it's getting it deeper and deeper as the list goes. We start from servicing things like dana and morality, sila, but then it starts to go deeper, and you can see it going in, in from self-control to non-anger. What's after non-anger? Ahimsa, which is non-violence. Non-violence. Non-violence is a way of life. Non-violence, ahimsa. You know, when we know from the great teachings of Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., we know that ahimsa is not just that I'm stopping from doing violence. Is turning the mind completely away from violence as an option. It's just foreign. Like you see the lie of violence, that it achieves the very opposite of anything it wants to. You see the violence is a complete lie. It's a deception. You see through that. You see the clarity with wisdom that violence achieves exactly the opposite of what it wants. That's non-violence. You know, it's not holding back yourself from being violent. Right? That's self-control. Self-control is holding back. Non-anger is when you take responsibility for your mind. Non-violence is when it's just not an option. You see the lie. <clears throat> for a ruler, though, I mean, the Buddha explained it a little further. He said, well, it's not taking vengeance, revenge, or persecuting others. You know, someone hurts you and 
and the ruler wants to show who's in charge. Again, the true ruler is in charge of herself. <clears throat> Going deeper into this, the next uh, number nine on the list is called Kanti. Kanti is forbearance, or another translation is patience. Patience. You know, the true ruler knows that he or she is not making changes or making programs for the next six months or two years, but for the next generation. The real patience is seeing the long term, the long vision, and saying, the changes I want to make are for generations. I want to have an impact. I want my intention to continue on. I want this perhaps to serve and be good when I'm no longer around. Now, there's this old legend that the Native Americans would make decisions thinking of seven generations in advance, that they discuss, you know, where are they going to move to or what are they going to do, where are they going to build or where are they, what changes are they going to make. And they have to think seven generations. You know? That's the enlightened quality or the Rajadhamma of patience. Patience. You know, I may never see the fruits of this decision. I may not see the fruits of this policy. Right? It may not happen in my lifetime. You know, the world may not start cooling until I and my grandchildren are no longer here. But I need to plan for that now. Right? Long-term patience. You know, we don't need a five-year plan. We need a thousand-year plan. Right? That's patience. Patience is thinking of the thousand-year plan. What, does the, what is the earth going to look like in 500, a thousand years? And how can I contribute to that? That's patience, isn't it? It's not going to benefit me. That's the altruism. The altruism is, it's not for my sake. Right? And the patience is, it's not even for my children's sake. It's like beyond. That's the gate, gate, paragate that we talk about in the um, Heart Sutra at the end. Beyond, 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 totally gone beyond Bodhi Soha. You know, I'm completely gone beyond. My vision has to go far. Right? That's the real um, Heart Sutra. <clears throat> and then full circle back to the practical application of this, the last quality that the Buddha teaches about um, enlightened leadership or Dhamma, the Raja Dhamma, Abhirodhana, uprightness. It's, he explains it as, interestingly, Respecting the opinions of others. Avoiding prejudice and promoting public peace. Respecting the opinions of others and avoiding prejudice. Well, they kind of go together. Because like, the hardest opinion to respect is by a group or by someone with whom you <coughs> have kind of a bias against, you know, or prejudice the enemy, or just the other, whether it's from a different group, a different family, a different nation. Mm. So we go through all these deep qualities and then we're like, it comes back to something real practical. Like, can you <coughs> consider and hear someone else's opinion if it conflicts with yours? Yeah. That's a Raja Dhamma. That is a quality of an enlightened leader. But only that can be achieved after you've gone through all these levels. Yeah. Which are really quite amazing practices and qualities, each one of them. Mm -hmm. So, is this possible? Well, yeah, actually it is. It is actually possible. There are historical examples. The most famous one is King Ashoka, who was a Buddhist king who lived around in the year of 300 BC, and um, he ruled India for 41 years. And he was a kind of like Alexander of India, young ruler who conquered huge amounts of territory in bloody battles. And after eight years of conquering and bloodying the countryside, one time in this famous sort of moment, 
he walked out on the battlefield, looked around at all the carnage and all the dead bodies. And it was recorded that he simply said, what have I done? He said, what have I done? And then he um, started to follow the Buddhist teachings, became a uh, full-on Buddhist ruler. And he's known, how do we know how he lived the way he did? Because there are over 30 stone pillars with his edicts. Edicts are like his sayings and rules that he created, like a whole set of rules that he wanted his kingdom to live by. And he made these pyramids of stone and, and not pyramids, like, yeah, I guess sort of small pyramids and um, stupas of stone and pillars that at least 30 have been found all around Asia. He had a big um, territory, it was much bigger than it included Afghanistan and Pakistan and India. And they're found all the way to the edge of um, the edge of Afghanistan. And some of those pillars were written in Aramaic, no less. Right? Um, so they were in ancient Greek and Aramaic, those ones on the edge of the empire, right? because those are the languages of, of that area. Um, some people think that, you know, his influence spread to the Mediterranean and Alexandria and places like that, including this area. But that's a different whole um, fantasy. So, <laughs> but what we do know about him from his edicts, from his commands that were left around there, so that when people were walking on the roads, they would read these pillars and know what the kingdom is that they're in. Like, oh, so this is what it's about? All right, this is what I need to follow? So, um, what, were, what, kind of, what kind of dynasty, you know, for, what was it, 41 years, or like 33 years? What kind of 33-year Buddhist um, empire did he create? Well, um, he did some amazing things. Um... The, one of the first things he did was he started to outlaw the killing of animals. You know, so animals could not be killed, especially for any religious purposes. He um, created a lot of hospitals and universities. And all along the roads, he created wells and bathhouses for people to like have water and bathe themselves. <clears throat> And in, on one of his edicts, when he wrote this, I'll read the edict for you. It's real interesting what he wrote on this, if I may, the social welfare. Um, this is just what, the, what it sounded like. I'm going to read a translation of one of the pillars. Everywhere in the dominions of the king and who are on the borders, there are two kinds of medical treatment for men and cattle. Wherever there are no herbs beneficial to men and beneficial of cattle, everywhere they should be caused to be imported and planted. Likewise, wherever there are no roots and fruits, everywhere they should be imported and planted. So we want everyone to have medicine. Okay. On the roads, trees should be planted and wells are caused to be dug for the use of men and cattle. And banyan trees should be planted in order that they might give shade to men and cattle and mango groves to be planted for the fruit. And wells dug by me, flights of steps for going into them, numerous drinking places established by me there for enjoyment of cattlemen. For the various comforts have the people been blessed by both former kings and myself, but by me this has been done for the following purpose, that they might conform to the practice of the Dharma and morality. So he, he put up all this stuff. Why? Because he wanted people to behave well, to do good. Right? He wanted people to do good, not to praise him. He put up all this stuff in his, um, <coughs> in his empire. He also talked about religious tolerance, that um, nobody should argue with another religion. Uh, he made forest reserves and he protected wildlife. The other thing is he standardized justice. So that he wrote that on one of his pillars there should be, you know, the same justice for all people, which is really quite an amazing thing back then, you know, to have universal courts and justice. 
So as we see, it's, it was pretty advanced at that time of history. Um, um, and then we have a long period without many examples of uh, leaders who are consciously trying to follow these 10 in whatever form they may find it, you know. Um, but we shouldn't lose hope because they exist. They really do exist. And, and you need to consider them as real life examples. These are not impossible. These are, are not impossible. And in fact, they are more common than we think. I think I mentioned uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And I was um, reading and listening to some of his speeches this week because I was thinking about this topic and I was saying, you know, he's, he's always seen as a paragon of that type of like, of like the ultimate example of, you know, a moral leader, you know, a leader who was, you know, coming from a deep, deep, um, a deep truth. And um, it, he gave a, um, he had a famous speech once. A lot of his speeches are known, like I have a dream speech. But there was one speech that I hadn't encountered before, and it's called Love Your Enemies. All right, Love Your Enemies. And it's a real beautiful speech, and any time you get a chance to actually hear him speaking, you should check it out, because as, as far as the art of speaking goes, he really is the best. Um, and he said, in order to love your enemies, <laughs> he said, the first thing you should do, he gave like certain steps in order to love your enemies, like a how-to manual, how to love your enemies, right? And he said, the first thing you should do is analyze yourself. That was number one on his list, right? I mean, the Raja Dhamma is not a Buddhist teaching. It's a human teaching. The Buddha taught it as a Buddha, and it was handed down as a Buddhist teaching. Right? But the Buddha Dharma is, is the truth of how to be uh, human and to live well, to not cause harm and to realize your true nature. And whether it's Buddhist or Christian or Jewish or Muslim, you know, anyone who's truly practicing. I, I doubt that Martin Luther King had much exposure to Buddhist teachings other than just meeting some Buddhist leaders. But he found what he needed to, and he found the truth. So number one, analyze yourself. That's what you should do. Number two, he said, you should realize that there is goodness in your enemy, just as there is evil in you. <laughs> so it depends what you focus on, doesn't it? You focus on the evil, you'll see evil. You focus on the good, you'll find what to love. You know, you'll find what to love. That was number two. <clears throat> and um, the third thing he says is to understand that um, <clears throat> that love is not an emotion. This is what he says about love. In the final analysis, love is not this sentimental something that we talk about. It's not merely an emotional something. Love is creative, understanding goodwill for all men. It is a refusal to, to defeat any individual. When you rise to the level of love, of its great beauty and power, you seek only to defeat evil systems. Individuals who happen to be caught up in that system, you love. That's really important. He refers to the three different types of Greek love the, um, in this speech, he does. The um, Greek love of Eros, that we know, which is sort of passion and attraction. The love of philia, like philosophy, which is a philia love, is friendship love. And then the final love that he talks about is what's called in Greek agape. And agape is that altruistic goodwill that's universal for all people. And that's the type of love that he's talking about. So when we love our enemies, yeah, we're not loving them like philia, like friends. And we're not loving them because we're attracted to them. We're loving them because as human beings, they deserve to be loved. And that is the basic right of each person. When we talk about the rights, human rights, the right to be loved is a basic right. And as a ruler, that's what we need to give. 
<clears throat> so, like all good leaders, um, Martin Luther King and the Buddha brought it back to something very practical. You know, how to live in this moment and how to really rule yourself in this moment that is going to maximize the good and minimize the harm. And in the end of his speech, he gave such a calm example, you know, and that's the genius of him. Is he's not saying, like, my struggles are so much bigger than yours. He said that he was in Tennessee, um, Tallahoosee, riding to Atlanta with his brother, and it was at nighttime, and he said that so many of the cars coming in the other direction, the drivers were being very discourteous. Like when you're on a highway, sometimes you have your high beams on. He said that nobody was dimming their beams when they went by. You know what that's like when you're driving and it's like right in your eyes, you know? And as soon as you see another car, you're supposed to switch off your high beam and just put on the low beams, right? That's like just obvious. He said nobody was doing that. But he said that his brother said, oh yeah, well, you know what? Next driver that has his high beams on, I'm going to keep mine on. <laughs> and um, and here, here's what he said. He said, oh, oh no, don't do that. <laughs> There'd be too much light on the highway. <laughs> and it'll end up in mutual destruction for all. Somebody got to have some sense on the highway. <laughs> Somebody got to have some sense on the highway. And then he said, Somebody must have some sense enough to dim the lights. And that is the trouble, isn't it? That as all of the civilizations of the world move up the highway of history, so many civilizations, having looked at other civilizations that refused to dim the lights, and they decided to refuse to dim theirs. Basic, basic. Somebody's got to have some sense on this highway. Mm. And it's got to be you. Mm. Nobody else. You can't wait for somebody. You can't wait for the, coming, for the person coming at you to dim their lights. You have to dim yours. You have to be the one who makes the positive change, who thinks of them even when they're not thinking of you. It's basic, but it comes from all of these really, really incredible qualities of a ruler. <clears throat>